So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jonathan Wu. I'm the Associate Director, Head of Distribution Operations for Premium China. Thank you for coming. We actually have more than 100 more advisors this year than last year across the country coming to listen to us. And I think it's obviously a lot to do with China's news. And I hope that what today we're going to give you is a, obviously some comfort as well as some certainty as to where Asia is going. I'll take a quote from last week. Fidelity ran their national roadshows, and people kept asking about China. And what would you define the current situation in China as? And Amit Loder, who's the portfolio manager for the premium, sorry, <laughs> for the Fidelity Global Fund, said it's a muddling through period. And the muddling through period is exactly that. Through any sort of structural reform you see in Asia and China today is not something we haven't seen anywhere else in the world. If you talk about and listen about the market intervention that you see that the Chinese government implements consistently over the last couple of years, it is, again, nothing we haven't seen before. Quantitative easing, after all, is still a form of government intervention. The issue has been is the definition of what people have seen as a route in the Chinese market. See, Bloomberg's been very smart, and what they've been doing is that they have been staggering the news points about China. They start off with 30% down in three weeks, followed by worst day in six and a half years, followed by worst week in eight years, followed by the China market route continues. The first thing I want to assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that is the A share market, which we're going to dig deeper into today. The A share market being the mainland Chinese market, not the Hong Kong market. Standard disclaimer. This is what we're going to go through with you today. We're going to deep dive into China. Now, what we did 18 months ago, we actually restructured the way we ran our roadshows. And the reason is we spent the first eight years of our business in focusing a lot of the macro side, because that's what people wanted to listen to. But for the first time in 10 years, we're actually starting to see advisors actually agree and actually take action on something that I thought would never happen, buying through a dip. For the month of July, we have seen the Premium China Fund net over $150,000 per day and the Asia Fund net in over $200,000 per day, whereas that was still net zero before July. And so it's very encouraging to see that advisors are seeing that, yes, I may have missed last year since July, but now there's a significant correction. This is the chance for me to get in. What we're going to talk about today is very little on the macro. We are here to tell you about the actual blueprint of how we derive our returns and then how to use that in your client's portfolio. The volatility will remain for a few more months from the way that we're seeing it. And sometimes the market will have a day where it drops 8%, like last Monday, and no one has any idea why. It's all a range of speculation. But then the next day it just recovers. That's the volatility we expect. So Alan's going to go through China and I'm going to go through Asia. And what you're going to see is a very, very distinct difference between what's happening in China and what's happening, happening in Asia, ex-China and ex-Japan, because it's two very, very polarizing stories. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to start going through some of the key structural reforms which will be driving our portfolio returns, how we're going to capture that, and then how does that, what does that mean for you as an asset allocator for your clients? So let's start off with a corporate update. So Value Partners was founded in 93 as the first boutique locally branded asset management firm. And today they are listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange with the management still earning a significant amount of the equity. Their investment team today is 62 members split amongst Beijing, Shanghai, Taipei, Chengdu, and Hong Kong, and we are still the only asset manager in the world that has operational jurisdiction in all three parts of greater China. So we pride ourselves on the number of investment staff we have. Ten years ago, we had just under 30, so it's definitely a reflection of the growth because they're now managing 
almost 18 billion US dollars, whereas 10 years ago they managed 3.5 billion. The key driver to our investment returns is not broker reports. It's two and a half thousand company visits on the ground, qualitative, not quantitative research. We spend far too much time looking at stocks. We're not macro pickers. Just like for Delhi, they made it clear, we're not macro pickers. So when advisors have emailed me and asked me, Jonathan, when the market route started back in June, did you manage to sell everything out? We didn't. And that's not what we try to do. Because at the end of the day, if the company, the underlying company we bought, the fundamentals there changed, that is the point in time when we, when we alter the portfolio. And Alan did do that, and he'll talk about what he did during that route as well. So our senior investment team is exceptionally strong. Alan is fifth in the hierarchy of the investment team, and this is his 13th year with Value Partners. The only bottom gentleman here as a senior fund manager is the fixed income fund manager here. Everyone else here are equities. So for the Premium China Fund, it is managed by Alan. The Premium Asia Fund is managed by Renee. And the Premium Asia Property Fund is managed by Michelle as well as Lewis. And the Fixed Income Fund is managed by Gordon. Best in class performance. For the last 20 odd years, up until the end of June this year, Value Partners Classic has achieved 16.8% per annum net of fees, charging fee levels that are hedge fund fees above zero. We charge against benchmarks of either moving benchmarks or 10% per annum or 12% per annum net with a high watermark to your clients. Plenty of awards in the last 20 odd years, over 100 in total, and last year they run four years in a row, Institutional Investor Hedge Fund of the Year. So that's all I want to talk about in terms of corporate, and I'll come back to talk to you about Asia and the Premium Asia, Asia Property and Asia Income Funds, but I'd like to hand over to Alan to talk about China. Alan. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my first time doing the roadshow with Premium China in Australia. And obviously, this time around, the market has been more volatile than ever. We have made very good profit for our clients over the past 12 months. Today, I would like to share with you what is the current situation that's going on in China at the moment, how we are dealing with it for the Premium China Fund, as well as go back in terms of um, some of the themes that were presented last year. Then to give you a quick overview of our short-term, medium-term, as well as long-term outlook for China, and finally, a quick review of the portfolio. This is the current situation for the Chinese market in terms of performance year to date. If you look at the left-hand chart, the purple line represents the Chinese Domestic Asia Index, the Shanghai Composite Index. It was up quite significantly up until mid of June, and it has come down by more than 30% from its peak for the past month and a half. At the same time, the blue line, which represents Hong Kong listed eight shares. The eight shares are very much similar in terms of fundamental with the domestic eight shares. In many cases, they are actually the same company with due listing, just with different share classes. And they have lagged far behind, even during the rally. And they have come down by less percentage as well during the recent correction. And if you look at the chart on the right-hand side, <coughs> the blue line, which is the eight shares, has been trading at a significant discount versus the eight shares. Now, we understand that eight shares was driven, particularly recently, by a lot of speculative activity, as well as margin borrowing from the retail investors. But those sort of issues actually do not occur in the Hong Kong market. The so Asia is driven by 80% retail participation, while in Hong Kong, institutional investors account for 75% of the market. And just to give you a perspective on the valuation of the eight shares at the moment, actually, 
a slight correction, the valuation of MSCI China at the moment. MSCI China represents the majority of Chinese equities that are listed overseas. So include the H shares as well as the red chips. Right now, in terms of PE, they're trading at about 20% cheaper than the long-term historical average valuation. And you will see a similar valuation discount for the price to book ratio as well. Also at a significant discount to the long-term average. If we compare overseas listed Chinese equities, again, the MSA China index, versus other markets in Asia, as is represented by the MSA Asia X Japan index. From the right-hand chart, you will see that MSA China right now is 16% cheaper than MSCI Asia X Japan. And what this says is that the Chinese equity market offshore, not the domestic Asia market, is now the cheapest market in all of Asia. And the chart on the left hand side just shows the valuation range of, the, of some of the world's major equity markets. And obviously, for Hong Kong, China right now is trading at the lower end of that range. So the Hong Kong listed Chinese equities are a lot cheaper than domestic Asia's. And they're less impacted by the usual speculative margin activities that are currently quite common within the Asia space. What we have done is that since the second quarter of this year, at around February, March, we have trimmed down our position in Asia. The peak exposure for the permanent China fund in domestic Asia was about 22 to 23%. We saw that the initial rally of Asia, which started in the fourth quarter of last year, was very sensible because Asia was trading at very cheap valuation. It had underwent a four-year bear market for quite some time. And we thought Asia will have a re-rating, and that was exactly the thesis we have presented to investors this time last year. But after a very strong rally, we saw that post March, the Asia was, again, was getting ahead of its fundamentals. And we also saw there were more speculative retail activity that resulted in a very momentum-driven market. So we took a cautious stance and started to trim back, taking profit on our Asia position. So for the past three to four months, our Asia exposure has come down to about 15, 16%. At the same time, we were more positive on the Hong Kong listed HS and the red chips. So we were adding the position back into the Hong Kong listed Chinese equities. And you can see that the exposure in Hong Kong in general, including the HS and red chips, has increased for the premium China fund over the past couple of months. A very quick review of what we said and did over the past 12 months. This time last year, one of our main thesis to our investors was that you should get more exposure in Chinese Asia. Back then, the most direct way of getting exposure in Chinese domestic Asia was through Q fee, RQ fee, quota, which Premium China Fund has. The reason for that was Asia was cheap. It's even a lot cheaper than what they are today. They were at the end of a four and a half year bear market, and we were looking for catalysts as a rewriting mechanism for the Asia to perform. And this time last year, we told investors that the catalyst will come in the form of the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect. That Connect program was launched in October last year. And as you can see from the green chart, which is, again, the Asia index, it has actually started to rewrite as a result of the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect program. And of course, like I pointed out earlier, since about the second quarter of this year, the share price has kept going up, 
and we thought that was getting far ahead of fundamentals. But using the same chart, what argument we're using now is that the pink line is now a lot cheaper and falling far behind the green line. And the pink line is the Hong Kong listed eight share index. So for similar rationale, we are telling investors that right now the best exposure you should have in China is not the A shares anymore. Because A share is expensive even after the recent correction, particularly for the small caps, and they're more volatile. You should have your exposure to the Hong Kong listed securities such as H shares and red chips. A shares for the past 12 months went from a 12% discount versus the H shares to 60% premium as of today. Just shows how quick the valuation change has been over the past 12 months. A second thesis we presented last year was SOE reform. I still recall that this time last year, I used Sinopec as an example about mixed ownership in large SOEs. Asset injection, internal integration, valuation adjustment, mixed ownership, share incentives, these are all part of SOE reform in China. All these activities are aimed at letting the SOE become much more efficient and productive and as well as competitive versus the private sector. Historically, SOE sector has been more focused on revenue growth, market share, and even how much taxes they pay to the state because they have a lot of social and political responsibility. While the private sector is more focused on return on equity for its shareholders and profitability. And all these measures are aimed at making the SOEs act more like the private sector and therefore have a more alignment of interest with minority shareholders. There are also broader, more macro reasons behind SOE reform, which I will present to you later on. The example we used for actually implementing an SOE reform idea for the past couple of months is a company called China Yangtze Power. Yangtze, obviously, is the largest river in China, and China Yangtze Power is the world's largest hydroelectrical power operator. It owns the Three Gorges Dam and as well as other assets. Right now, China Yangtze Power has 26 gigawatt of capacity. Its parent company, which owns more assets, both under construction as well as in operation, has undertook to inject another 20 gigawatt of hydroelectric power into the listed company over the next seven years. Electricity generation is a very simple business. Capacity, demand, supply, tariff, input costs are the only major factors that affect their profitability. In this case, we know that China Yangtze's capacity will grow through asset injection by 80% over the next seven years. It's not hard to deduce that over time, its profitability will increase by roughly the same amount. So that will give you an earnings growth CAGR of about 11 12% over the next seven years. Nothing sexy about it, but with high degree of certainty. This is the type of stock that we like to invest in through the backing of the parent company and the reforms that underpins the company's future growth. We do not want to invest in an internet company which is trading a triple digit PE today, where the management guides you that they will grow 100% next year. Even if they do achieve the 100% growth, it's, it's still going to trade at 50 times PE next year. And that growth is highly uncertain. 
That's why we have avoided the majority, actually all of the small cap names in the Asia space. When we do our investment, certainty is the key. We believe currently the, the government policy provides a supportive investment in, environment for investing into China. I don't believe anyone out there, whether it be foreign investor or a local Chinese investor, that actually believes China's GDP figure. 7% growth in the first quarter, followed by 7% growth in the second quarter, no one really believes those. On top of my head, you know, talking to other colleagues out there, we put the GDP growth in China at roughly about 6.5 to 6.8% which is quite low compared to the official figure. But what's more important is that the government realizes this as well. Putting the official statistic aside, anecdotally, everyone knows that there's a lot of slowing down pressure within the Chinese macroeconomy. Deflation is a real risk. Inputting costs has been going down for a few years now. Inventory are still being digested. Even though the service sector has been growing stronger, but the overall manufacturing sector has been weak. And net export is just about neutral. So from that perspective, the government has had adopted a loose monetary stance since late last year. For the past nine months, there have been four interest rate cuts, as well as four reserve requirement ratio cuts. We believe this sort of monetary loosening will continue in the second half of this year. Also importantly, the fiscal front is also very supportive, and the government is doing a lot of proactive fiscal spending. In areas such as railway, infrastructure, particularly in the central and western part of China, where it has not been overbuilt compared to the coastal regions, there's still room for infrastructure and fiscal spending. Just two days ago, the Chinese central bank announced that it will issue one trillion renminbi of construction bond to policy banks for ongoing support of infrastructure projects in China. This bond is backed by the central bank, so effectively, this is a smaller, but Chinese version of quantitative easing. I'm sure that the government has learned its lesson. It will not do a similar sort of four trillion st stimulus, as was the case during the GFC of 2008, which ultimately led to some side effects, such as overcapacity and high inventory. But some form of fiscal stimulus is definitely warranted. So, yes, the headline numbers doesn't look that great. But like Jonathan pointed out earlier, what we do is more about stock picking. And we do believe that the current macro environment is more supportive of investment into China. What is our short-term view? This, again, for those who, of you who are not that familiar with, the different share classes in Chinese equities. A shares, as listed on the Shanghai and Shenzhen stock exchanges, are the domestic share class. B share is a very small market. For those of you who have followed Premium China in the past, you will have known that we have had decent exposure to Chinese B shares in companies such as China Banki, Chan Auto, etc. But it is a rather small part of the market. For all intended purposes, we do consider eight shares and red chips as, as very similar. These are Chinese equities that are listed in Hong Kong. As I pointed out earlier, A share is a volatile one, it's an expensive one, it's the one that recently had a very sharp correction. It's also the one that are quoting a lot of news headlines. Given the volatility of A shares and the government's supportive measures that has put into place to support the A shares, 
we think that in the immediate short term, we remain a cautious view on the Asia's. But we are still positive on the Asia of the longer term, which I'll talk about later. B share is a smaller market. We'll do whatever we can to find value there, but there isn't really that many companies to choose from. So right now, the premium China fund still has about 6% exposure in B shares. But what we do like, as I pointed out earlier, because of valuation, is H shares and red chips. And moreover, Hong Kong listed securities has been under more international investor scrutiny over the past two to three decades. When Chinese equity first listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange in the early 1990s. So in a way, they had better corporate governance, better transparency as well. When we told investors that we like Asia this time last year, we talked about the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect as a catalyst for the rewriting of Asia. We believe that a catalyst for H shares and red chips is coming just around the horizon. And this catalyst is called the Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect. The Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect is essentially expanding the current universe of A shares as well as Hong Kong listed shares available for investors to invest into across the border. So on the domestic A share side, what we call northbound trading, it will simply expand the existing Hong Kong or company listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, uh, Shanghai Stock Exchange, rather, to the Shenzhen Stock Exchange. It's a natural expansion of the universe of Asia that can actually be invested into by Hong Kong institutions. Given that the Asia market itself is already quite large, so we think the impact will be less compared to Hong Kong. And the reason is being, under the existing Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect program, only 280 companies in Hong Kong, out of a total of 1,000 companies, can be invested by domestic investors via this program across the border, which is a very limited subset of the Hong Kong market. What we envisage is that when they launch the Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect program, the Hong Kong side will be expanded from the current 280 names to up to 700 names. And that's almost a threefold increase. So really, the impact on the Hong Kong side will be much more profound compared to the natural expansion on the Asia side. And that will serve as a catalyst, particularly given that where H shares and Richmond are trading so cheap right now, as a catalyst for re-rating or catch-up rally of the Hong Kong listed China equities. And just to give you a glimpse of things, you can see from this chart, the line chart, particularly the red line, the spike in the red line was in April this year when the Chinese regulators announced allowing domestic Chinese mutual funds to invest into the Hong Kong equity space through the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect program. Even though they have not done so, but the anticipation actually drove up a sharp increase in fund flow into the Hong Kong market. Besides the Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect program, which we do expect to be launched later this year, very likely to be around October, which is the one year anniversary of the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect program. We do believe there are other measures allowing domestic institutions to invest overseas. The spillover will come from what we call QDI 2 trial program, as well as further relaxation of the capital account. Now, anecdotally, I have spoken to a lot of domestic insurance companies. Besides the very large ones like China Life, Ping An, which are the ones that people heard of, and those are the ones that already have overseas operations as well as overseas assets, thereby allowing them to invest into overseas market directly, 
There are many smaller insurance companies in China that currently do not have any overseas exposure whatsoever. And for them, they want to diversify their portfolio. They want to have some degree of overseas exposure, even if it just means 5 or 10 percent. But the aggregate of that is a very large amount. And we are expecting that those institutions are looking at the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect, the Shanghai, uh, sorry, the Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect, as well as the QDI tools as a means of investing overseas. And Hong Kong will be the first port of call. How do we see the market in the medium term? Reform remains to be the key for Chinese capital market performance. There are many areas of reform, social, political, financial, corporate. For our purpose as investors, financial and corporate SOE reforms are the key to look at. Last year, I talked about SOE reform already. I would believe that this will be a continual theme for years to come. SOE reform is a means of tackling existing investor interest, making the SOEs more competitive versus the private sector. The only area that the private sector is flourishing right now is in the e internet e-commerce sector. Other than those, you know, very much, uh, other than the, 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 the internet and e-commerce sector, many sectors in China are still dominated by the SOEs. We also believe that reform of the SOE sector will act as a very important tool for Chinese macroeconomic restructuring, as well as fixing the balance sheet of the local governments. Over the years, the local governments has racked up, obviously, high amount of debt as they support a lot of capital expenditure, infrastructure spending, etc. But the local governments are also the biggest shareholder in many SOEs. So one way for them to fix their balance sheet is actually to privatize the SOEs in the public market, i.e. public securities. And to do that, we need a more stable and efficient capital market to achieve that. So we believe the causation is Chinese government, from macro perspective, do want a stable equity market so that the many SOEs can actually trade by privatization as listed companies and thereby making both themselves more efficient in the process as well as helping the major shareholder, which is the local government, to actually repair their own balance sheet by realizing the value they hold in these SOEs. Financial reform. This year, one of the biggest milestones for the Chinese government in terms of um, with, it, with, with its neighbors, uh, as well as foreign policy, has been the setup of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. And this will go a long way in terms of promoting Chinese manufacturing, construction, and even credit to its neighboring countries. And we think it's one way to actually export some of the existing Chinese excess inventory and helping the, uh, the country divest its overcapacity or, or digest, rather, its overcapacity issue in many, um, in many sectors. And also, obviously, during the process, China will gain some influence over its neighboring countries as well. Another important financial reform program that China is trying to achieve within the next 12 months is the renminbi, internationalization of the renminbi. And the important milestone which is, will be whether the renminbi will achieve the International Monetary Fund's special drawing rights status. Just yesterday, IMF had an internal meeting, and there was a paper on it. I think it was reported by the Wall Street Journal that the IMF will have a vote on the renminbi entrance as the SDR currency 
by the end of 2015. If successful, the implementation of the renminbi as the fifth reserve currency will be done over the next or done over the, a period of nine months in 2016. So hopefully, by this time next year, the picture will be extremely clear whether the world central banks have to hold renminbi as a new reserve currency. Now, contrary to the recent volatile A share market or the equity market domestically, there have been some major development in the fixed income market in terms of reform. About two weeks ago, the Central Bank of China actually announced allowing foreign central banks as well as sovereign funds to access the Chinese interbank market's fixed income security without any limitation. In the past, they have to have what we call the RQV quota to do so, but now that restriction has been removed. And this is actually a very important step if you think about it, because essentially it paves the way for the central banks as sovereign funds to actually hold renminbi assets directly, and for them, the biggest asset in the portfolio is not equities, it's fixed income. So for the renminbi to achieve a reserve status, you need to have accessibility for the world's central bank. And they have just opened the door for that. So we think it's actually a very important step. And of course, from an equity market perspective, even after the recent rally, the Chinese equity market the depth of it as percentage of GDP still falls behind the other great markets in the world, like the US or Japan. What's our long-term view? Asia inclusion into MSCI Emerging Market Index. Two months ago, MSCI came out with annual review paper and said that Asia will not be included in the year 2015 into its emerging market index, pending for the removal or overcome of a several technical barriers or technical issues that are focused more on accessibility, ownership of shares through the stock net program, et cetera. But once those technical barriers are overcome, MSI also said that they do not need to wait for the next annual review in 2016 to actually include Asia into the emerging market index. So which means that the remaining work are really just technical in nature, and Asia can be included as soon as those hurdles are overcome. But it will be a very long-term process. Even if the Asia is included into the index, let's say, next year, it will start off with a very small percentage and gradually increase over time within the index in terms of weighting. So we believe that this is really a long-term theme for Asia, probably over a period of um, seven to eight years. But there are others who have acted on this trend already. FUSI which is a, well, it is the world's second largest but less prominent index provider compared to MSCI, has already front-run MSCI and launched its own Asia-included emerging market index in May this year. Sure, you might argue that there aren't that many funds actually track this index, but it just shows that as the second largest player, they know the importance of Asia over time, and they want to be one of the early ones to actually give investors a sense of how the emerging market in this might look like if Asia is included. Um, a follow-up on that is that was one of the world's largest ETF provider, Vanguard, has actually used the FUSI emerging market China Asia included index to launch an ETF fund. Again, 
The size of the ETF fund is not very big, it might be very, very small. But still, it shows that the ETF providers are also a, you know, giving investors a sense, or at least accessibility, that if you want to track the ACS in a world where it's very part, a, a, a very important part of the emerging market, how would you do it? And how could you do it? So I think that the trend is there, and there's no dispute about the growing importance of ACS over the longer term. So based on our view on the short-term volatility of ACS, the positive outlook and view on the Hong Kong list of ACS and red chips, the longer-term nature of the market development, how do we Im implement our investment strategy? Since Late last year, I have adopted what I call a bar bill strategy. Now, the percentage of the sector exposure have changed somewhat over the past six months, which I'll explain. I have sectors such as property and insurance. These are relatively high beta sectors. So if market rallies up, these sectors will outperform. And I have the more defensive sectors such as healthcare, utilities, and what I haven't shown on here, also IT. Now, this time last year, I have had about 20% exposure almost in property. And that's a contrarian view, because I know that for most investors, they either are very cautious on property, or they don't want to charge Chinese property-related security at all, because they're perceived as high risk. You know, the usual things that come to mind are Overbuild, affordability, ghost town, that sort of thing. But the Chinese property market has been doing well for three years up until the middle of last year, or towards the end of last year. And many of the Chinese property names were trading at very low valuation already. We know that at some stage, given that the state of the economy, the government will start loosening up on things like home purchasing restrictions, interest rate, etc., and that will benefit the property names. So we took a contrarian view and had 20% exposure in Chinese property, almost, this time last year. And over the past 12 months, almost every single position that we have in the property sector delivered 100% return on, in, on an individual basis. But of course, as those thesis, like interest rate card, home purchase restriction removal, have been crystallized, we have been taking profit over the past couple of months as well. So our exposure has come down from near 20% down to the current 11%. On the flip side, we like Chinese utilities, particularly the renewable energy sector. And this is more defensive versus the border market. So we start off about 10, 11% utility ex exposure this time last year. But as the market became more volatile in recent months, we have switched more into the defensive names, thereby our utilities exposure has grown to the current 19%. At the same time, we look for other opportunities out in the market, not necessarily any particular sector, what I call the white horse as well as the dark horse. The white horse are usually the very transparent, growth with high certainty type of manufacturing names. They usually try at low valuation, growth are like between 10 to 15% per annum, and um, just very straightforward OEM or ODM type of manufacturer. Nothing exciting about them, but just solid market leaders. Well, the dark horse, like in the consumer sector, are the ones that are potentially turn around stories. So for example, the consumer sector, generally did very poor in 2014, but we see some of the names actually making a turnaround in 2015. Very quickly, just to go through some of the sector ideas one by one, of all the major financial sectors, we like the insurance subsector the most. We have a neutral view on Chinese banks. Chinese banks have no earnings growth. 
So you cannot rely on earnings growth as a driver of share price. They have decent dividend yield, more than 5%, so they're good yield plays if you simply want to collect the yield. And they're not alpha plays in the sense that it's very hard to get elder performance versus the market by investing into Chinese banks. Because the share price and the valuation is a direct reflection of investor sentiment towards China in general. If investors generally are seeking more risky assets, the bank's valuation will get lifted and vice versa. And given the fact that they already account for anywhere between 30 to 40% of the index, depending on which index you're talking about, you buy the Chinese banks, you buy the China market. It's very hard to get out of performance. We are cautious on the Chinese brokers. We used to like them, but now we're cautious because as trading volume, as well as margin activity come down in the second half of this year versus the first half, brokers will start to lose a big chunk of their revenue. And we will expect that half on half earnings for the brokers will be negative. Insurance is the only subsector we like because insurance companies not only that they benefit from better asset returns, but more importantly, they have very robust premium growth, which is a form, a, 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 an important factor that drives the future's return. Insurance company generally, in the first half of this year, has over 20% premium growth. And they have also become much more innovative. Historically, if you were an insurance company, you have to employ, employ a large agency force. And that's quite costly. But going forward, more and more insurance companies are exploring ways of tapping into the internet, e-commerce, as a way of selling their premium. At the same time, Chinese residents who have insurance policy is still a very small part of the population particularly so in the rural areas. So the government, the regulators, are also encouraging more insurance policies being taken out in the forms of premium tax rebates, subsidies, etc. So one company we have invested in for the past six, seven months is called New China Life Insurance. We first bought into this company towards the end of last year and we're still sitting on some very decent profit as of today. Now, the company was actually suspended for roughly about a month in January to February this year. You can see from the flat line of the share price. What happened back then was that the company suspended and was undergoing negotiation about tie-ups with a major internet player. And the rumor was Alibaba. At the end, the negotiation did not go through, apparently on pricing, but shows that this company in future might have another go at a tie-up, a strategic tie-up with an internet company. And we believe such tie-ups are very beneficiary to the future growth of insurance companies. That's why we still hold it. Utility sector, a more defensive one, we like them across the board. The coal power ones are benefiting from low coal price. Coal price in China, particular thermal coal, is down 20% year on year as of today, and 17% versus the beginning of this year. So the input costs for thermal coal players are lower. We also like hydro, China Yangtze Power is an example, and nuclear, we participate in a nuclear power IPO last year, and other renewables such as wind and solar. A company we invested in, Huanang Renewable, it's a pure wind power operator play. The company's share price, I mean, we've held this company for well over 18 months now. The company's share price was pretty flattish, to be honest, in 2014. And that was predominantly due to very weak wind conditions in China across the board. 
but wind conditions are recovering in 2015. The company also has very strong capacity growth through greenfield projects. And already, the company has announced its first half earnings growth to be more than 50%. Going forward, we believe that earnings growth will maintain at 20 to 30% for the next two to three years on the back of further increase in capacity to construction of new projects. And wind, as well as other renewable energy, is still a very important part of the Chinese macro policy in terms of, of giving support in order to combat pollution. 20% ROE, 15 to 20% earnings growth, one times price to book, single digit PE, would you invest? Sounds excellent to me on paper, but it's the Chinese property market. Most people get scared of it. Just like I pointed out earlier, we were contrarian in investing in the property stocks this time last year, and that had delivered very good return for us for the past 12 months. As the market started to recover through the removal of home purchase restrictions, interest rate cut, et cetera, we have gradually sold down our property position, but we still hold some. What's driving the prices now is the recovery of physical market sales. You have to be very stock specific when choosing a property stock in China. It's a very large country. Even among the different listed companies in this sector, they behave very differently. We want to choose companies that are large tier one players with diversified portfolio of projects in the tier one and tier two cities in China. It's just like anywhere else in the world. The tier one cities benefit from better supply demand dynamics. Property prices in Sydney has gone up a lot over the past 12 months. Property prices in Beijing, Shanghai has similar experience. But I was, we, was in, uh, we were in WA on Monday, and a client told us that some mining town in WA, over the past four months, property prices have come down by more than 50%. I was amazed. Just like in China, if you had project in a mining town, of course you're going to get oversupply, and ultimately even in ghost town situations. So your exposure is very important. You can only achieve that through a lot of bottom up bottom-up stock selection. Very briefly on healthcare, healthcare obviously is a sector that has less correlation with the macroeconomy. In China's case, it actually benefits from long-term uh, aging population, and that ultimately leads to increased demand for services, drugs, etc. So it's a sector that we view it as very defensive, and again, you have to be very stock specific when choosing the, 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 the actual uh, ideas to buy. Um, an example here is a company called China Traditional Medicine, or Traditional Chinese Medicine. We bought this company through a share placement, a secondary share placement, in about March this year. And right now, we're still sitting on about 30% profit. I would believe that as a leader in traditional Chinese medicine manufacturing, this company, again, you know, will benefit from the market growth of um, the overall healthcare sector in China. Another way for value partners to add value is through participation in primary or new share issues. Value Partner has a total AUM as a group of 17 billion US dollar in Hong Kong now. So we are large enough to negotiate share issuance prices with the issue of the security, i.e. the company or the investment banks, whenever there's an initial public offering or a secondary share placement. So today, I saw a term sheet that ANZ is actually doing a placement to raise 2.5 billion Aussie dollars and they're offering institutional investors up to 5% discount on the share issuance. So similar type of transaction occur in the Hong Kong market. When a company wants to raise new funding from the market, 
they have to offer the market a discount. Otherwise, investors can simply buy similar type of comparable companies on the market. So if you want me to buy your shares, you, you offer me a discount. And that discount does run between 5 to 15%, depends on the market capitalization of the individual company. And it is that IPO or placement discount, even though it might just be 5 to 10%, but if you do enough of these type of good deals, it does add up to the alpha return for the portfolio. So over the past 12 months, for example, we have participated in four cornerstone, oh sorry, in four IPOs as cornerstone investor. And the majority of them work out very well for us. What are the risks? Some of the macro risks include rising US interest rate. And that, to be frank, is negative on emerging markets in general, not just on China or Hong Kong, but for all emerging markets. And the market has already reacted to the anticipation of rising US interest rate since the fourth quarter of last year. But we believe that once the US actually increased interest rate, just like historically in the past, it might be the inflection point for global funds reallocating back into emerging markets. Jonathan will talk more about this later on as well. But from a China perspective, the biggest risks, of course, come from corporate governance as well as policy mistakes. On the issue of corporate governance, there is no easy way out, to be very honest. You just have to be on the ground, know your companies very well, and do a lot of grassroots cross-checking type of research. Now, the good news for us is that Value Partner has been doing investment in Hong Kong China market for the past 23 years. So over time, we have built up what I call a mental data bank of companies that we trust, companies we believe that provide genuine and transparent guidances, and companies we can actually trade with confidence. For newly listed companies, particularly small ones that have very short track record, we're generally quite cautious on. Our investment team altogether has more than 50 investment professionals now. So it's a very large team that achieves this very challenging task. And policy mistake. Yes, the Chinese government is trying to support the Asia market. But, like Jonathan put earlier, it's a modeling through process, and they're also learning it as they go. So with all good intentions, sometimes they make the wrong decisions. Something that might be reducing market volatility might end up with adding more market volatility. But again, all these issues or risks are less so in the Hong Kong market versus the Asia market. So in this very volatile environment, again, one should be focusing more on the Hong Kong side of the Chinese equities rather than the domestic side. Quick two minutes on portfolio update. Up until the end of June, which is this data actually uh, shows, our fund had delivered very strong absolute as well as relative performance. The Premier China fund delivered Positive performance of almost 28% in the first six months of this year, which outperformed our benchmark, the MSI China Index, by about eight percentage points. Even though July was again a very tough month, but I'm pleased to say that our fund still remained to be in the positive territory in terms of absolute return, and also our elder performance versus the index has be even better, given that MSCI China is now down about 8% year to date. Our long-term track record is also excellent, with an analyzed return of 14% almost, versus the index 11%. But also more importantly, our volatility is 3% lower than the border index. And this shows the current top 10 holding of the Premium China Fund, 
as well as the sector exposure. And as you can see from this table, we have a very diversified portfolio in terms of sector exposures. We don't have high concentration in any single sector. And for some of the largest sectors we do have exposure to, such as utility, information technology, we consider them as more defensive versus, versus the border market. So with that, I finished my presentation on the China Fund, and I pass, John, pass on to Johnson for an update on the Asia Fund. Thank you. Thank you.